Peter, are you with me? I'm with you. It sounds better on my end. Does it sound better yeah, on yours? Yeah, yeah, that, that is much better. I think we got, got the problem solved. And, uh, Peter, uh, I was uh, just walking through with our listening audience this piece from the Atlantic Monthly by Lindsay Miller, self-identified queer woman, who, and, and I was I was amazed, frankly, and I want to get your reaction to this, Peter. I want to talk about the born this way thing and some of the research you've done here in just a moment that pertains to that that question. But and I was frankly amazed that the Atlantic, which is a, a publication over on the left end of the political spectrum, even published this piece where she says, "I would like to state for the record that I was not born this way." Uh, I mean, what was? <laughs> I mean, what's your reaction to this? Well, every every now and then you have uh, a, a homosexual activist or a liberal uh, media outlet like The Atlantic that dares to tell the truth instead of saying what's politically correct. And I think it just illustrates the, the, the point that the whole myth that homosexuals are born that way is just that it's a myth which is designed for political purposes and doesn't really have much to do with the truth. Uh, now... This is a particular something that you, you hear particularly when you read uh, writings of, of lesbians and read about lesbianism, much more common probably than among male homosexuals, this sense of there being an aspect of choice. Now, I've always emphasized that people don't choose to experience same-sex attractions, but they do choose their behavior and they choose their self-identification. Uh, but in the case of uh, lesbians, it seems there's a much greater level of choice involved in, in choosing to uh, live a lesbian lifestyle. Uh, and uh, even, even though they often uh, don't, aren't willing to acknowledge that. You know, and I was struck too by something she said here. I was just reading this paragraph, Peter, before we got uh, hooked back up. Uh, she refers to the condescension of straight people who believe that queers can't help it and thus should be treated with tolerance and pity. A couple of things that struck me is, number one, straight people aren't saying that. I mean, at least in the pro-family community, we aren't saying that people can't help it. We believe, as you said, Peter, that sexual behavior is always a choice. You can't control the impulses, but you can control how you respond to those impulses and which ones you you yield to, and that's our focus is on behavior and behavioral choice. Exactly. So we're not saying that they can't help it. So it seems to me it's homosexual activists are the ones that are out there saying that that uh, gays and lesbians can't help it. And she refers to this as veiled condescension. That kind of struck me that um, that she thinks that that is a that is a view that condescends to homosexuals uh, for them for, for for this mean to be perpetuated that they're born this way and can't and can't help it. Well, right. And, I, and in a sense, it is condescending for, to suggest that they cannot control their behavior, uh, regardless of where their sexual attractions may come from. Uh, uh, they, they can control their behavior. And uh, I always emphasize the fact that, that we call on people with opposite sex attractions to exercise high levels of self-control as well. We encourage heterosexuals not to act upon their sexual attractions if they're attracted to someone uh, other than their spouse. And so, um, so it, it is uh, condescending to suggest uh, whether you're a gay activist or whether you're a, a, a heterosexual, whoever you are, it's condescending to su suggest that someone has a, a, an obligation or is incapable of, of not acting upon any sexual desire they may happen to experience internally. You know, it's really kind of a view of, of, of human beings as nothing more than, than animals who are sort of in the grip of this uncontrollable lust and heat, have no control over it. And we have a much more noble view of humanity because we believe men and women have been created in the image of God and therefore are morally responsible people. They have free agency. They can make choices. Uh, they can make sexually responsible choices. Now, I've got a column that's up today. It's up at rightlyconcerned.com on this uh, subject. I encourage you to go there if you get a, an opportunity, those of you in our listening audience. And I link to some research that Peter has done. He's got a very uh, an outstanding piece of research called The Top Ten Myths About Homosexuality. That, and he has a section where he deals with this issue of being born this way. And, Peter, I'd like to have you take an opportunity. We've got about three minutes left in this segment. Uh, just to walk us through what you discovered as you researched, what have researchers concluded about the whole born that way meme well there were uh there were three studies in the early 1990s that 
kind of gave birth to this idea that there was a gay gene or that, uh, uh, that there's a biological origin to homosexuality. But none of those three studies have, have stood up to subsequent scientific examination. So that now even the American Psychological Association, which is quite staunchly pro-homosexual in their policy statements, uh, has said that there is no certainty in the research as to what causes um, a person's sexual orientation. And the most decisive thing, I, I think, uh, debunking the, the born gay or the uh, gay gene theory is the um, research that's been done on twins, on identical twins. Because if you have, uh, if homosexuality were caused by someone's genes, then when one twin is um, homosexual, you would expect their identical twin to also be homosexual 100% of the time because that's because they have 100% identical genes if they're identical twins. But that's not what we find at all. Even the early uh, studies uh, suggested perhaps no more than 50% concordance rates. But more recent and more scientifically accurate studies have shown concordance rates as low as five or six percent uh, so that when one twin is homosexual only five or six percent of the time is their identical twin also homosexual that pretty much debunks the idea of a gay gene right there well i'm looking at the research i pulled out of your paper peter uh, by peter bierman and hannah bruckner the study you're just referring to right. and they're researchers from columbia and yale so these are not yahoos these aren't rednecks. These are not people that are in the pocket of the pro-family movement. They're researchers at Columbia and Yale, and they found that the concordance rate was 6.7 for male identical twins and 5.3% for female identical twins. And, uh, twins. and as you pointed out, Peter, you should expect a concordance rate of 100%. So what this suggests, and uh, we've got about 45 seconds here, Peter, what this suggests then is that environmental factors have a lot to do with the way people identify themselves as they grow into adulthood. Yes, and that's what Bierman and Brookman says. They said that the data does not suggest genetic influence independent of social context. They said they falsified the hormone transfer hypothesis, and they consider and reject a speculative evolutionary theory and concluded our results uh, support the hypothesis that less gendered socialization in early childhood and pre-adolescent is what uh, shapes same-sex romantic preferences. Our guest so it our, supports oh, the developmental theory. Our guest on our Decision Maker line has been Peter Sprague, Senior Fellow for Policy Studies uh, with our good friends at the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. Peter, thanks for being patient with our technological uh, glitches, and thank you for your information. Appreciate your time, and God bless you. Thanks, Brian. You too. Peter Sprague, Family Research Council. We'll be back with your phone calls and more. Stay with us. Focal Point, AFR Talk.